small fraction, a small fraction community, uh, com community characterism. Nationalism is really awesome. We can just go long and straight in a foreign country to say, oh, I'm a proud citizen from a particular country. You feel a sense of belonging. You feel justified over yourself. You feel attachment to history. Nationalism is also pretty awesome, but this is the only alternative, and this is the only rhetoric that small states, this states, and weak nations can actively fight against, fight back against colonialism. I'm going to just raise this message, but I will quickly talk about the setup and why exactly the alternative are way for us. See, I was just talking about why nationalism actually make people feel good about themselves, not only to like make Americans like uh, racist. This is probably their own skill issue. The sad for the Americans. Finally, I will talk about why this is a crucial metric for uh, post-conflict states to reconstruct their nation. So let me start off. Let's start off. What exactly is nationalism? We define nationalism as the intrinsic desire for you to identify yourself as a particular citizen from a larger group of society that you share a communal history and you share a communal rights and obligation in your sovereign state instead of the comparative is that oh you live in like a lord like castle and you live in a comparative of like a British imperialism etc. And secondly, we are saying the reason why nationalism exists in the current status quo are basically for two reasons. Firstly, it's just people's literally innate desire to always seek for a group of sense of belonging. So that is to say that people always have the desire to seek a sense of belonging. We are saying when you are seeking a sense of belonging in a nation, it is way better than when you are seeking a sense of belonging from an individual or like your small family or your very very like radical small community. Uh, finally, I will talk about uh, the second way how nationalism is projected. I think it's because lots of nations just literally got invaded, and after they got invaded, they are inspired from their trauma. They have a trauma bonding process. Reconstructing their nation, that is the fundamental reason why nationalism formed at the very beginning. This debate should not only talk about why Western nations are racist and they're using nationalism as an excuse. This is also should be a debate about how Asian countries are reconstructing themselves after they have been actively invaded by evil nations before that opening. But why is it that conservatives identify with nationalism so much more than liberals? Uh, so, firstly, uh, some will deal with that, and secondly, I think that only uh, occurs in particular nation that these politicians already have a like, right-wing or left-wing uh, radicalism. And I don't think that actually uh, uh, applies into the circumstances when you're reconstructing a nation, and that is something that you want to overcome your trauma. Uh, so you say that we are very communal with our people to our castles. Who is elected to each castle? Oh, can you explain? So these Just your be, point. Will this be my people that go into the castles? Uh, I would further talk about why the comparative is that uh, probably in colonialism, uh, not in colonialism, in Middle Eastern Europe, uh, you don't have a uh, sovereign state, and the comparative is that you live individually or you live in this kind of a laws and live in these kind of castles instead of like being bonded together by a sovereign state and you have a state government who actually have democracy and they can vote in you to have political freedom. Firstly, you're talking about why the alternatives are way worse. Firstly, I already proven to you that people have an innate nature and an innate desire to actually see community, which means that a lot of, 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 of comparative alternatives is that when you don't have nationalism, they do not have a, a state, a nation to belong with, the alternative is that they up to A, they're probably like bonded with their neighborhood, which means that when you're bonded with the neighborhood, you're actually having more complex. We're saying even though nationalism probably potentially drive some sort of conflict, however, if everybody is like bonded by neighborhoodism and everybody are just constantly having conflict between their neighbors about oh, whether or not you have this particular land, whether or not I have this particular land, we're saying these skills of conflict are much more micro and this skill of conflict is much more frequent in reality. And I think a second comparative is that if they don't believe that people have a desire to seek from a growing community uh, anyways, we're saying it is also likely to lead to individualism, where individualism 
reconstruct your mental health. Uh, secondarily, I think like even for in modern day society, you still feel good about yourself. Like if you're Australian, you go to America, and you look at the accent, and you're like, ha ha, I'm a Australian citizen. People seem to like, feel good and so awesome about themselves, but they know the nation is an attachment to uh, their like numerous history. Uh, your nationalism is attachment to your entire culture, and your nationalism is something that it may bring you the power to have a bigger community, a bigger sense of belonging, where you can probably know that when
But so that explains the domestic harms in terms of increasing racism and things that we think is pretty intuitive. The next thing is about how it like causes the domestic harm of less accountability to its development. This was A, you believe your government itself and the nation itself is good and therefore can't have faults, and the release has less faults than it actually would. You don't think it's flawed. But secondly, the government directly uses this, uses this as a front for their actions to do bad things. It looks like Nazi Germany, where they use nationalism as a front to be not accountable and to actually engage in non-democratic practices. Secondly, now on international harms. A, there is simply just more war. Firstly, you perceive other countries as not as important as your own. Your interests matter more. That is inherent nationalism. This looks like the US being more willing, and the populace of the US being more willing to let their country pursue oil in other countries to engage in intervention because they see their country's interests as mattering more. But secondly, it is simply used as a justification for lots of interventionist actions. This is the reason that you see your country's itself and you see your country's morality as being above that of others. When you decide that you yourself are the moral arbiter of what is good and bad because your nation is above the others, you're more willing to intervene. You're more willing to go in and invade Vietnam because they're communists and you disagree. You're more willing to go in and take oil from these countries. You're more willing to go in and unjustly invade places like Iraq. This means that your government is more willing to do this. This means you get more support when the government ends up doing this. Your government, um, you believe further things that you are able to govern them better than they, they can govern themselves. You're more willing to intervene in their democracies and things like that. That explains why you see directly more conflict. But secondly, it leads to more international parts in terms of, um, in terms of the fact, oh, this is actually messing up, that it leads to things like non-democracy. A, because as I said before, it's tied to conservatism, which is like inherently engaged in lots of non-democratic practices. But secondly, there are lots of other things, such as the fact that national unity is used as a front directly to engage in non-democratic actions. But furthermore, democracy itself is often tied to other nations. So this is like democracy being heavily tied to the West and the West ideals. So when you yourself stand as a non-democratic nation, you are opposed to democracy because you stand for your national identity, which is shaped around being non-democratic. This looks like Africa, this looks like North Korea, where those countries had non-democratic situations, and as a result, they were opposed to engaging in democracy and democratic principles because they saw it as being directly against their national identity, their principles as a nation. For those reasons, it directly results in you being less willing to engage and create democracy in these countries. I mean, democracy is intuitively good, it happens less on the opposition side. I'll take a few eyes in closing. So I, well, like I think they're less able to collectivize against an identity. But as well as that, lots of these places still have, like, end up having democracies, and they become privileged as a result. But necessarily, their ability to actually weaponize what they have and weaponize their interests. Because obviously, you pointed out they have the same incentive, but they don't have the same capacity. Because your ability to weaponize and get your populace to engage in war, to enlist, to actually fight in these conflicts and support the ongoing intervention, is something that's drastically reduced when those people believe that they themselves are directly above in a hierarchy of nations. That they don't have the ability to be the moral arbiter of whether or not this country is good and deserves to have its choice over its government. Now, finally, now on the economic harm, we think this results in lots of protectionist policy to overall bad for the people, people protecting and internationally. It's because you don't want to let in other ideas. This was in Japan before the US actually forced them to open up, being highly nationalistic and not wanting to let in Western ideas. Secondly, though, there is simply a fear of your corporations being beaten out by other nations' corporations who want to protect against them. Now, quickly on open government and their sort of silly claims. They talk about how this brings nations together in reconstruction, about China post World War II. Hey, what do you think started World War II? The next thing is about the reality that this results in like this return to natural identity occurs particularly badly. This results in things like the Cam Cambodian genocide. But as well as that, I'd like to ask you to weigh this off against things like the Uyghur genocide in China. Be honest with me, it's probably not the best. Next thing talk that has causes imperialism. That's just silly. Obviously the cause of imperialism is a couple of things, but if you're willing to put it on one thing, it's probably more nationalism than not nationalism, because it is the idea that your nation is above others, that it deserves to have access to these resources, or at the very least, that your government and your ideals as what government should look like is what you believe and not what they believe. So you should have the ability to go in, intervene, and put in place what you think is a correct government. For those reasons, imperialism is far more likely on your side than it is ours. The belonging stuff was silly. Obviously, the stuff that matters is your community and your neighborhood. That stuff is what impacts people. You still get that on our side. For those reasons, we're proud to work on nationalism, there was not harmony. There was not a magic love for everyone on planet Earth, regardless of their race and regardless of their proximity to you. There was always hate. There was always a desire to prioritize your individual needs over others and to do whatever the fuck was necessary to get to your needs. 
But that is a hate which has developed over time, and as we have progressed towards nationalism, we have moved away from things like tribalism, from things like caring only about the approximate religious or racial community, the people you see day to day, and who are the most exogenously likely to have empathy for, towards caring for people in your nation. People who you could help, people from disadvantaged communities that you could uplift, and as Attica explains and will ignores, nationalism is not the belief that you are better than everyone. That existed anyway. Nationalism was the belief that you had an obligation to everyone in your nation, that inherently from their participation in that group, they were deserving of your respect and you had an obligation to help those people. And insofar as the alternative to nationalism is what pre-existed it, is wars, is tribal conflicts, is racial hatred, we explain why nationalism is necessary to achieve that collectivization. Go Jets. Are we using a made-up definition of nationalism or Oxford Dictionary? <laughs> I do not know what the Oxford Dictionary definition of nationalism is. Let me provide a perfectly reasonable and explanation of what it is. What is the real alternative to nationalism then? We explain to no response that na the alternative to nationalism is smaller communalism. Because people will naturally default to caring the most about those who are more proximate to them. The people that they see and therefore are easily able to develop empathy for. But also the people for whom they benefit the most when they actually look after those people. Which is precisely why not only is this the alternative to nationalism, which still leads to you hating the out group, which still leads to you wanting to screw over that out group. But it is an obligation which can coexist within nationalism, because obviously nationalism does not supplant care for your community, it just expands the scope of that care to people who you otherwise would hate and otherwise would be happy to screw over. Because there is a motivation to hate people unless you are persuaded to feel an obligation to them either way. First of all, because of the very fear of the other that opening opposition describes, it will exist and that they have no solution for. But second of all, because there is an intrinsic desire to help those approximate to you, raiding the communities through which you are not a part of benefits your own community. So if you believe that that obligation exists, you get a stronger desire to screw over everyone else within the nation to whom you do not feel an obligation. This explains why it is only through nationalism that we're able to achieve the kind of large-scale communalism which is absolutely necessary for saving those who are most disadvantaged in society. The three very basic reasons. First of all, it gives you the reason to be empathetic to people within your nation. You actually, they are protected by the obligation which you feel to them for the mere fact of their participation in the same nation as you, regardless of whether they go to the same church as you, regardless of whether you see them on a day-to-day -day basis. But secondly, because this enables you to uplift the most disadvantaged, because of course nationalism is the prerequisite to strong national government, to things like centralized <coughs> systems of taxation that redistribute resources to communities that could not look after themselves. Because if you only care about communities more proximate, you would never help the most disadvantaged when you were helped, when you were when you were succeeding. But third of all, it was the reason that you actually were incentivized to collectivize, because when you wanted to come together in a large community, you did need to give up your needs. You did give up, need to give up some of your autonomy. And the non-existence of nationalism was the precise reason you never had the motivation to engage in this. No, it was the reason that you never were willing to give up control. And it's obviously the reason why you did not get the formation of communities that were useful. If you believe in this debate, it's a good thing that rich communities are able to help poor communities insofar as they belong to the same nation. There's obviously a huge benefit for opening government, which is never contested. The next thing I'm going to explain in this speech, though, is why all of the bad things that opening opposition talks about are likely to exist even without nationalism and are likely to exist to a far worse extent. First of all, why is it that nationalism is unlikely to be exploited in the ways that described? The first thing I observe is that a true definition of nationalism is very difficult to manipulate and weaponize because people have an intrinsic right to participate in the ideology of nationalism because of their belonging to that nation. That is, that the mere fact you're within that nation is what entitles you to speak out against the use of nationalism. It's what entitles you to have a stake in the way that that is described and a stake in the way that the community is formed. And if you find this unpersuasive, imagine the alternative. Imagine the alternative where no stake exists. If you believe that racial minorities have a hard time advocating against conservative rhetoric and the status quo it gets far, far worse on side opening opposition. But secondly, the way that Ude wants to talk about you know, nationalism being utilised by conservative rhetoric, we would suggest that the way that we describe nationalism in the debate is not what he is talking about. And note the way that words can be twisted. People can lie about their policy intentions and use words like nationalism to hide non-nationalistic intentions. We would describe that is the phenomenon which Ude describes, which is precisely why it is likely to exist on either world. Because we explain that nationalism is the feeling of an obligation or the fact that people have a right to participate in a community for, their mere, for the mere fact that they exist within that nation. And so, as I explained previously, this is why it 
right, the left truly does align more with nationalism. To the fact that you have an obligation to care for people for the mere fact that they exist in your nation. The fact that they have a right to access shared communal resources because they're a part of that nation. In a world where nationalism does not exist, the pariah narrative is of racism. The, 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 the succeeding narrative is that of fear of the other. Precisely why it all gets worse, worse on off bench. Secondly though, why is it that the worst forms of hatred will exist anyway? First of all, the desire to exclude people will always exist. Because the more people you kick out from accessing resources, the more that you benefit. So when there's no narrative of nationalism slows down, it merely gets worse. Secondly though, fear of the other will always exist. There is always a distrust of people who you do not know, who come from different cultures which you may not understand, who have not become empathetic to from mere exposure therapy. Which is precisely why racism is not nationalism, racism is racism. Nationalism is what within the nation allows you to overcome racism. And maybe it is true that in the larger scale, nationalism does make you fearful of other nations. We would suggest that one, that fear exists anyway. But two, it's unclear why, it's unclear why that fear is more important than fear internally. You, it's very difficult to hate crime someone that exists in another country. It's very easy to hate crime someone that's from your own nation. Precisely why we are able to prevent the most harm when we give people an obligation to those who are most proximate to them. But finally, we can flip this, because nationalism is the reason that these narratives change. It is what allows people to participate in discourse and claim and state the right of claim to participation in that national identity. And obviously, pro-immigration rhetoric can be justified by nationalism, can be justified by furthering the national intentions and the national goals. These are all things which can be justified through nationalism. Finally, on internationalism, Obviously opposition here, which needs you to believe that the alternative to nationalism is some global community to which everyone feels an obligation, and they themselves disprove why this is the case. So without nationalism, if nations cannot have empathy for each other, I ask why individuals would have empathy to each other. I ask why, for instance, these smaller communities in America, they would not want to raise those who are more proximate to them, for whom it is easier. So you get more of the violence and more of the war that side opposition talks about. Nationalism is the solution to this problem. Finally, there is no response to the benefits of feeling good about yourself, repairing post-conflict states, which Anger explains. And obviously, feeling part of something bigger is exactly what gives you purpose in this world. Never proud to propose.
that have we want to believe, which is why in post-conflict states, nationalism is terrible, because instead of saying that you want to have people existing in different ethnic minorities, which is largely where they need a lot of conflict in the first place, you would say, we have to pick one, because we want to be a nation, and we want to be united, and we want to be strong, so that means we have to pick one of you guys, and we're going to, we're going to disprivilege everyone else, because you need to have a cohesive national identity. The next thing I just say is, well, you can protect yourself from other states, we would just put, like, uh, in terms of neocolonialism, we would just point out that often this is symmetric, or often, or like, for the reason that often, in times of conflict, nationalist parties can just say that this other party, like, uh, we, we will align with the parties that are most closely na uh, aligned with us in terms of race or things like that, and exclude the countries who would not be. Let's then discuss the other pushes in terms of why nationalism is particularly good in domestic, uh, in, in, in a domestic sense. The first is just to say, well, actually, left of people are the most nationalist, and because progressive policy is good, this is why we should support nationalism. I don't think, like, at their best case, maybe, but this is, nationalism is the reason why left of people who are nationalist trend conservative over time. So I think the reason why maybe now uh, Mao had great ideas about the fact that we should be liberating, uh, like we should be, like, li be liberating people who are particularly poor and disprivileged in China, but then in order to get that during the Cultural Revolution, forced people in Tibet, for example, to, like who committed a genocide in Tibet because he wanted to maintain his national identity, even when they were trying to liberate, liberate people in their country who were more poor, because fundamentally it is about protection of your own values and your own beliefs. It is an idea that you need to maintain the way your nation exists because your nation is the most superior, and you should do that to the exclusion of other countries. They lastly say, well, you can help people in need because you really care about the people who are poorer in your country, and if you're a nationalist, that is the only reason you would help them. Firstly, obviously you do not if you are nationalist for the reason that People who are poorer, people who are disabled, often women are seen as reducing the strength of your nation, and the people who are leading your nation are often the people who are the most privileged. They are often men, they are often people who have come from uh, ethnicities of privilege, which means that, firstly, you would you would be uh, like anti all of the kind of people that they want to support, for the reason that they are seen as reducing the strength of your nation, which you want to be particularly strong, but also for the reason that all the people who you identify as being like crucial to your nation, the kinds of people that are leaders and the kinds of people that tell you how you should think and the way that you should view your country are people that are from enormous positions of privilege, which is why nationalism is the reason that you never end up helping those people in the first place. The other note I would just make is nationalism is the reason that minorities are now forced to assimilate in this community because they t it tells you that you have to give up your culture in order to be in this kind of nationalist majority identity, and that has a few parts. Firstly, you give up your culture and that is incredibly detrimental for you because you take away a large part of your identity and something that you truly have a lot of meaning for. Secondly, it means that you don't pull out the racist and xenophobic policies that exist in your country because of nationalism, which means it is a self-fulfilling prophecy and you never improve that cycle. But thirdly, we would just say you then try to keep yourself in the in-group, which is the reason why you are more likely to be protections of, towards other minorities by saying, well, now that I've got a footing in, I have to make sure that I don't use that footing, so I'm going to try and exclude other people from that kind of thing. Which is the reason why a lot of women in power are particularly are, are particularly discriminatory towards gender minorities, for the reason that now that they gain power, they feel the need to exclude that, so that they can continue on to their power. Then I just want to note the, the final stuff on their domestic issues, because they say, well, you don't contribute and you don't pay taxes otherwise. Like, obviously people don't pay taxes because they want to keep their money. See Jeff Bezos in the USA, which is one of the most nationalist countries ever. But also people pay in taxes because you care about people with the greatest kind of contributions that they've already outlined, which is why you entrench this kind of discriminatory standards by saying, well, you can't pay as much tax in this country, that is why you are less, that, that is why you are less important to us. Last thing I would just say, they say it gives you a sense of community. One, this is inaccessible to the majority of people who suffer from racism, who suffer from xenophobia, and nationalism perpetuates. But secondly, it would say it's better to be in an actual community where you actually can identify, which is why they, where you can actually identify with things that are meaningful to you, which is why that kind of factual or fractional community is preferable, because you can actually have a genuine sense of community instead of feeling like you are forced to assimilate into the majority one in order to be of any sense of value. And if you must think conservative, in order to, to like, continue with your nationhood and identity, then it means over time you lose that sense of community because people gain more progressive understanding, but their community remains conservative and their national ideals remain conservative. Before I go on, uh, questions, closing?
have to facilitate all the different desires of these different fashion communities. So we flip opening government pretty conclusively on all of their plates. Ours are very certain, and they exist on the spectrum of plausibility. Even if you do not believe that every single person is incredibly racist, people would have racist tendencies, and that would be incredibly bad. But we also just protect the most vulnerable people in this debate. Lastly, on very quickly on international issues. Firstly, we would say that you are less likely to trade in a way that works detriment to your economy because if you, if you suffer economic shock, you have no trading partners, you can't fill those gaps. But also because internationally, you deprive other countries of the resources that you previously would have been able to give them. And also, just a brief on the kind of war that was described. It doesn't get much of a response. I think it's still standing in this debate. But it's just to say that nationalism can also do incredibly harmful things, like force you to have conscription, like make conscription policies far more likely because you'll see it as weak and unlikely to help your like country if you don't. For all those reasons, kind of oppose. It's not really clear to me at the end of opening car what the alternative world looks like. Because opening government says a few things like, oh, people would be more communitarian, people might be more individualistic. Oh, it was like, oh, would they live in castles? And then it was like, oh, maybe, I don't know. Uh, what we're going to prove to you at closing government is that the alternative without nationalism is that the nation state wouldn't have existed. And we're going to prove the reasons why that is the why that wouldn't have happened, which is what opening government fails to do. So I would note, opening government suggests, you know, councils may be an alternative, but only in response to the UI. This extension will explain why without nationalism, nation states wouldn't have existed, which takes a higher burden than opening government, because at best, they just say like, oh, the alternative is communitarian, or, or like, oh, there's, you know, it's less, is less liking your neighbor, or maybe the state wouldn't be as functional because welfare systems wouldn't be as good. We're gonna explain why it would be structurally impossible for those states to, to be created in the first place. And just one note of framing, I wanna deal with the contention from DLO that this is a perspective debate, so it's only about things that are going uh, forward into the future. This is incorrect. This debate is about supporting a thing that includes the entirety of that thing, right? Like, if we're supporting a particular thing that includes the way that that thing was created, the way that that thing continues to exist. I think that is the most reasonable reading of this topic. Yes, yes. So, the people in the past can support nationalism. The question is, should this house support nationalism? Can you say that? Well, it's like, I don't know, like, this house would support, like, this house supports the Holocaust. Like, it's, it's not like it would support a new one, right? Like, it's, it's like, obviously you wouldn't, right? But the debate is about a thing that happened, right? Uh, and so what we're saying here is that this thing, exists and has existed for a while. We support the fact that it exists. I think that is uncontentious. So, uh, why then, uh, and what are the reasons why nation states wouldn't exist? We have three. The first is to say, existing power structures before the nation state had a very strong grip of power on power that was only able to be broken when nationalism came around as a, as a plausible idea that people were able to buy it. What were those power structures? In many instances, it was the church, it was kings who had their power ordained by God, by the heavens, who literally had no accountability for that power, right? Because if your power does come from God, no one can tell you how to use it properly. And so that means that that is, uh, that is something that has allowed those people to entrench their power over generations, and it was particularly hard to break out of it. But secondly, that power often comes from things like empires, right? And empires, of course, go back to like the Roman Empire and earlier, right? Where power is vested in whoever can take control of large territory, whoever has the most physical power and physical dominance. And those groups who are often ethnic groups, who are often uh, people who have particularly divisive views, those are the ones who have intentional power. So not only are these things bad for the reasons we described, but that also explains why it's particularly uh, unlikely that they'd be able to be usurped from that power unless you had nationalism. The second thing I would note is that nationalism is fundamentally the only pro-social ideology that rich people and elites were amenable to. That is to say, rich people and elites have a lot to gain from nationalism. They can gain collective resources and take control of more capital. They can gain the ability to go to other states and go through different borders. They can gain the ability to spread uh, you know, their personal ideolo ideologies onto a grander scale. And those are the sorts of things that they want to do. But you know, any other alternatives that might have been good for democracy, good for people, good for the common guy, uh, just wouldn't have also allowed those advantages to exist for rich people. So it was particularly easy when nation states did form, uh, in all the various times in history that they did, to get a critical mass of the elites on side to support the formation of that state. That is particularly important. Thirdly, though, I think nationalism has been particularly important for the establishment of post-colonial states. 
And I know this is not the most complex states, as Oakley government talks about. These are the states that broke off from things like the British Empire and the French Empire. And that is important because the British Empire would only allow decolonization because of the widespreadness of the belief in the right to self-determination based on national identity. And that is something that only nationalism uniquely allows those states to use as a bargaining tool and a rhetorical device to explain to the colonists who had power over them for so many years why they should have freedom. For all of those reasons, I just think it is so, so unlikely that the nation state or any similar form of government that exists on its large scale would exist in the opposition world, and that has a number of key impacts. So, the second extension is to explain why nation states are particularly important. The first thing I would like to note here is all the benefits that opening government gives you about why nation states might be good. We unlock those benefits by proving why nation states only exist on our side. So to the extent they want to talk about like the redistribution, welfare and stuff, we think the most important analysis for why those benefits happen comes from closing government, who explains why those structures exist in the first place. But I think there are a set of other reasons why we're able to access a set of uniquely important benefits. The first is to say, the creation of the nation state has allowed for much faster technological development, including things like medicine, including things like technology, like transportation, that has allowed people to improve their lives, lives fastly. That is for the simple reason that you have much more centralized planning and use of capital and use of resources. You allow people to specialize. You allow people to concentrate their ability to create new things in the same areas. But it also is because you have a competitive incentive with the other countries now. Right? Because now, and yes, competitive incentives might have existed on a communitarian level before, like a small kingdom or whatever, kingdom, uh, or whatever. But when you have a much larger group working together in a competitive environment, that means you're more likely to get technological progress. The next thing that capitalism has allowed is it has made it much easier, sorry, the nation states has allowed, is it made it much easier for capitalism to succeed. And capitalism is a great thing. Uh, capitalism has, uh, 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 sorry, okay, sorry. How has nation states allowed for capitalism to succeed? Through the development of legal systems, through development of things like limited liability corporations, which can only exist when you have a large enough area that is under the same rules, under the same nation state, that has the same sort of, uh, sort of democratic input to those rules, and that is really important. That means you do get things like the expansion of investment, the expansion of capital, that lifts billions of people out of poverty. The next thing that we've unlocked is the ability for people to live in democracies. I think it would be very unlikely that in elites entrust people to vote for the government if they aren't part of one, you know, part of the state that has that power. You don't have uh, sort of this idea that that state is for the people. That means you don't get democracy, and I think elites just continue to have control in their world. But I think the final thing that you actually do get, and this flips some of our stuff, is you get international cooperation, right? Like the UN only exists if you have nations who can be part of the UN. Yes, the UN isn't perfect. Yes, sometimes wars exist. Yes, sometimes it has a Western bias. But per capita, deaths have decreased so much since World War II. There are so much less people going to war. There are so much people less dying. And that's because of the peace treaties and agreements that only happen when you have nation states that can agree on them. Way this material. It doesn't rely on any contentious definition. It has the largest scale in this debate, but it also has the most certainty. It doesn't matter whether it's left wing or right wing. It simply provides the establishment of states that are functional, states that are effective, and states that serve the people within them. saying this, but closing government really should read the world's manual before they make their case. These debates absolutely do occur prospectively. You absolutely cannot just attempt to, you know, regret something in a motion that does not have the word regret in it. What opposition bench must defend in this world is going forward whether or not this House would support nationalism or would prefer a different counterfactual moving forward. Even if that was not true, I would note they're still contingent on believing that nation states are good and that Nationalism is a force of good going forward, which probably just means they don't get over their opening to begin with. Let's deal with the top half then. The problem here is quite simple, and I think CG does identify it to an extent, which is that it's really unclear 
whether any of the harms or benefits of the top half of this debate are specific to nationalism, because I think they're true of any in-group or any out-group identity. Any in-group gives you a sense of belonging, unites people, allows you to cooperate, allows all the things that PM wants to talk about, and similarly, it is a necessary condition of any in-group or out-group that some people are in the out-group rather than the in-group. It's a necessary condition that the in-group is prioritised over the out-group, that they might privilege some people in the in-group, that they might lead to some good policy or some bad policy. The question to ask then is what is the alternative and why is it that those same harms do not just occur in any other form of identity that necessarily has that in-group and necessarily has that very same out-group. That is what closing opposition's extension will explain, which is why the likely counterfactual is one of international cosmopolitanism, is one of <laughs> ideas rather than one that is of nations. Why is that likely to be the case? First thing I want to note, uh, and I guess this again in response to closing government, is that this is a debate about 2023, not 1803. And we live in a world where people see far beyond their neighborhood, as opening government would suppose, which is why it's very unlikely you would default to just thinking about what the people in your community are and why you would just default to caring about only those people. It is not true that you only care about those most proximate to you because things like air travel, things like the internet, things like international trade and globalization mean that those who are closest to us are not just those who live around us, they're those who share our ideas, they're those across the world, they're those in various parts of other nations who we get along with, whom we agree, who we realize increasingly over time that we have far more in common with than we could ever have in difference. It is because every person appreciates the benefits of peace. Every person benefits the, the capacity to pursue their own happiness, to have dignity, to have equality, to have respect, to have equal treatment before the law, to have an input into the way in which they're governed, to have their voice matter, a capacity to engage in trade and commerce, to better themselves, to gain prosperity. Those are the things that every person around the world believes in. Those are the things that unite people, and those things are far more powerful than any artificial form of distinction that might come between them, that might tell them they're different. Nationalism might have been better than things that came before it, because it grew a very large in-group and allowed people to cooperate within it, but it still has an outgroup, it is still imperfect, and we would say in the 21st century, nationalism is over, the time was there to allow everyone inside the group, to allow everyone to allow those things that we now recognize are far more important to come to the fore. In the 21st century, we've increasingly recognized that things like our race, that things like where we were born are arbitrary, we do not control them, and that's precisely why they do not matter. That is precisely why they are not the things that we should construct our identity around. The fact that we were born 20 kilometers from someone else does not mean that they should matter to us more than someone who might live on the other side of the globe. That is the contention of closing opposition, and that is why we will win this debate. Firstly, yeah, closing. If this debate starts today, that's worse for you because people increasingly in the world want to feel a sense of belonging and without nationalism are more likely in global conflict to go towards things like race, to go towards things like ethnicity. I think that is untrue, and I think the trend stretches far more in the opposite direction. If you ask the average person who lives in any metropolitan city what they identify with, they're increasingly unlikely to say that it's the idea of nationalism, which is why I peel away that to PM at the very beginning of the debate. People no longer think about the arbitrary concept of nationality or of race as a thing that defines them. They think about ideas. They think about their love of democracy. That is why, for example, so many people in the West support Ukrainians in fighting for their right to be free and democratic, despite the fact that they don't share a race, despite the fact that they don't share a nationality, despite the fact that they don't share culture with these people, it is because they identify with the similarities, the desire for peace, the desire to pursue happiness. Oh. That is what matters. And it's certainly in Putin's interest, for example, to have Russians believe that Russian is the identity that is most central to who they are, and is the one that matters to them, because that is an identity that the people in power are able to control. It is one that is constructed explicitly to allow for things like a conquest of Ukraine. The idea that Ukraine is inferior, the idea that it necessarily must be conquered, but what we would say is that there is no reason to believe that that is true, that the average Russian does have far more in common with the average Ukrainian than they do with Vladimir Putin and with the people who run the Russian mafia state, which is precisely why when you break down the barriers of nationalism, that is precisely what you are like, likely to see. It is why nationalism is increasingly weak. Opening government, do you have anything? Yeah, if there are so 
fall hard up these people go your way and they get less. So the reason is that nationalism is constructed by the people who happen to be in power within any one country. And they tend to construct those identities in a way that is beneficial to them, that privileges people that look like them, or that allows them to exercise control over groups of people in a way that differentiates and produces outgroups that are convenient to them. But the kinds of identity we talk about are ones that form organically. It's not that people just notice that lots of people like peace and created the peace in-group. It is that it is an inherent part of humanity. It is that something that speaks to every individual person, just why you do not need someone to construct it, which is why it cannot exclude people, which is why it was so powerful in this debate that allowed people to actually engage with each other in ways that were meaningful. It was things like engaging in trade that had mutual benefits to everyone involved and allowed people to enrich each other. It was engaging in international institutions. Look at how, for example, the formation of the EU has weakened the idea of national identity within very many of those countries as people realise the benefits of engaging at a higher, deeper level with each other was far more powerful. The commonalities people have were always going to be far, far stronger than any artificial distinction that could be created. Nationalism inherently was constructed identity that emphasized those differences to benefit those in power, to allow them to pit people against each other, to prevent them from engaging in peaceful coexistence and peaceful trade that allowed them to gain prosperity. That is why closing opposition wins this debate and we are so, so proud to oppose. <laughs> Firstly, what is? Secondly, what could it be? Firstly, on what is. And what is is our perception. Because uh, we get, I think, broadly, one main attack, which is that it does not fall within the definition of how this debate uh, will occur. I'll win, firstly, if this is true, and secondly, if it's not. Firstly, in terms of why it's true, and I would encourage every judge to uh, man F in the world's judge manual, uh, apparently it's on page 30, which is that you are uh, in support debates uh, should support the idea in its totality. So you can just command F in its totality. And that's exactly what we do in this debate, that when you are supporting concepts in debating, you are supporting that concept uh, generally, which is why if a support debate is a policy, you would have to support, you would have to prove why it's likely to occur because you're supporting the policy itself in totality and are thus not bound to say exactly what it is. Secondly, even if you don't believe that, uh, there are a few reasons why opposing government wins the debate. Firstly, the current state of the world is one that does often necessitate the development of new states because of things like time, uh, because of things like climate change, because of things like decolonization. Uh, colonization, but that uh, next, our extension explains why nationalism is the key force that holds everything together, that prevents anarchy and states themselves falling apart. Because nationalism is the one thing that can unite people, that can get people to coalesce around an idea. And the central planning that nationalism provides, we explain towards no response, is not something that occurs. So, given that, why is it incredibly important, and, and why is it the case that this extension that receives no response other than a definitional quibble or to win the debate? Number of reasons. Firstly, nationalism is uniquely important for your autonomy, because I do believe that it is just not the case that CO is right, and that people, if they worked generally in a global collective, could work out things that are good for them. The reason they could work out things that are good for them is that they have a set identity, they work in smaller areas, and they work with those people, that you can entrench laws in a certain place and say that you ought to apply these laws because you are a member of that identity and so you ought to do that. Next, we explain why nations will be able to facilitate all of the benefits that open government identifies because all of their benefits, I think, are conditional upon states remaining together, remaining as a part of oneself. And so we uniquely explain why in opposition to this, states would fall apart and would not work together. Because it is only nationalism that can convince me to do something, right? Because uh, state apparatuses function around identity. If I'm not prescribed to something, 
I do not know why a police officer would have the right to, to throw me in jail, but I do understand that within the context of a nation state, because I understand that I'm a part of a collective, that I am bound to its laws, and those laws are not arbitrary, because I'm a part of them, because that is a part of my functioning and my identity. Next, we explain that nation states are in and of themselves are incredibly important in preventing things like violence through uh, the, co uh, you know, the, the cohesion of states in, with things like peace treaties, through states collaborating and working together in a way that filters out noise, in a way that means you don't have a bunch of people all squabbling against one another, because states can clearly delineate what most of the people in that area or uh, you know prefer. So, at the end of that, I think that there is really no attack that stands on our extension, and it is the thing that ought to win the debate. Uh, before I go on to point of information, yeah, so after all, at best, this is kind of factual as well, it's going to be unique in the nation state. But at least people can live their lives freely without their culture being erased, without the racism and the prejudice, without other nations. All right, I'm getting to your analysis later, but I, I would just like to know, in terms of weighing, I do believe that it is more important that people can live safe lives, people can live lives in which they're protected, people can live lives in which they can coalesce around identities. Because the only way in which I am able to determine what I ought to do and what I ought to uh, you know, believe is because I have the facilities, I have the technology that a nation state has given to me, that I have the public infrastructure that means I can survive to keep going with those beliefs and uh, that in the old The next thing I'm going to do in this debate is just flip all of the analysis we get out of off bench in terms of you know, like people having identities. Uh, and the bit of framing I'd like to use here is that Barack Obama, after winning the 2008 election, <laughs> said that there are not uh, black. America, there's not a black America or a white America. There are just Americans. And it's our belief that nationalism is the very thing that prevents that hatred and that despotism. So, why is it the case that nationalism uniquely prevents these ideologies? This will be a flip of the material we hear earlier. And that is because, one, you can uniquely, as opposed to almost every other identity, change your nationalist identity. Because you can move between states and select for those things, but it's not the case that you can do that around other forms of identity. And that, secondly, it is very difficult to identify the sort of identity that ought to be prescribed oh, upon yeah. someone. And then thirdly, it is much harder to engage in conflicts around nations. And white nationalism can sometimes be about race, but race and perceiving people purely based on the basis of that is always about race. So we achieve their harms maximally, because we explain that is always the way in which people engage with these yes, sorts of things. Uh, point. Yeah, sure. The vast majority of states throughout human history have been you brutal monarchies and dictatorships that enslaved their people at gunpoint. Why is that a winning case for you? Ah, would you prefer not to have it? Because I would. I, I would say that sometimes there are bloody states, sometimes states aren't good, but states have provided things that keep us alive. States have made all of this and everything in this very room because individuals and collectives aren't able to organize information in the way that states are. Individuals and collectives are not able to work together cohesively to enforce laws in the way that states are. Individuals are not able to enforce things upon people that allow them to do things because sometimes your rights are curtailed in an state. That is true, but the alternative they to defend is, I think, a world of bloody anarchy, a world in which no one has the ability to determine their future because the infrastructure that states are necessitated to create, the roads that can only exist because there are millions of individuals that all pull their money towards doing that would not have existed otherwise. Next, let's deal with uh, CO's case about uh, international cosmopolitanism. Uh, I think this is really stupid. Uh, there are a number of reasons why. Firstly, there is a very clear out group in the CO world, which is the people who aren't able to do that. People in third world communities who don't have the infrastructure in order to engage, who either one, don't have the facilities and technology to do that, or two, would be bullied in the world in which they do that because they have nothing to bargain with. Because yeah, some people like to sing Kumbaya, but most people, as is identified by their own opening, are self-interested and do things that are in the best interest of themselves. Then next, do you really believe that if you got the average reasonable voter in America or in Uganda, they'd say, well, everyone everywhere is all the same? Or would they say, no, fuck off, get off my lawn. I do not have to bow to you because you are not the state that I give. And then lastly, Literally just look at the example that Uday gives in his speech, which is the support for Ukraine, a group that he exclusively refers to around their national identity in and of themselves, which is why that, I think, loses. Lastly, opening opposition says we will go to more. I think this is identified by uh, closing opposition as one, the uh, quite symmetric in that those uh, incentives exist. Secondly, coalescing around other identities is worse in this instance. Things like race are much more tied towards purity. And then thirdly, the incentive towards what is mitigated by states for all of the reasons we explained as why states can engage in peace treaties, etc. All of those reasons mean I think the closing government does take this debate. Well, yeah,
starting in three, two, one. Most people in this world have more things in common than they do have differences other than those who are created for them by people in power. Most people in this world want peace. Most people in this world want respect. Most people in this world want dignity. Most people in this world want a reasonably good quality of life. And this is that exact thing which nation, nationalism stops you from getting at all points in time. This is that exact thing that nationalism stops you from getting into that internationalist viewpoint of mind that we talk about at Odai. Because there are vested interests by the people in power, by the people who want this nationalism to exist, to create that in group, to create those differences that exist between people in, like, say, developed countries or developing countries. This vested interest of you being nationalist is the reason why you have this idea that Archie talks about, that someone in the USA would say, get off my lawn. This idea of nationalism is something that is rotting to its very core. I think this idea of internationalism is something that stands at every point of time. Because you also have examples in the very world, like what I tell you about, which goes vocally unresponded to. You have things like the EU, which is working really well. You have things where humans have been able to stop thinking about things like, ah, this arbitrary piece of land is where I must come from, and this is what I identify with. Humans can think beyond that. Humans can go beyond these weird ideals of whatever you belong to. That is what we stand for in this debate. First on OO, second on CG, and third on OG. I think OO gives you two things. First, on why nationalism is bad, and second, on why international trade and stuff gets worse. I think there are three ways in which we take OO. And the first is just to tell you that we actually give you a counterfactual. They, in a vacuum, say that nationalism is bad, but we actually go forward and tell you why there's an actual counterfactual that exists, which actually breaks the deadlock that exists in the opening half of whether the counterfactual is going to be things like humanism or whatever. We tell you it's likely, and we analyze you why internationalism is likely to exist. The second reason is we also take on a higher burden than just saying nationalism is bad, because even if it's nationalism is good from the opening up whatever you believe, you still must believe that internationalism is still better because we co-opt all of the benefits from government. But the third thing is, all oh, literally only just says international trade and stuff gets better. We actually give you mechanisms on how internationalism gives you those mechanisms to go forward and make those things better. That is why we win. On to CG now. CG gives you like basically two ideas. The first on why no nation state would exist, specifically focusing on post-colonization states, and third, and second on the benefits of this. I'm going to take this down for the first of why we win on nation states. Three responses. First, it's a prospective debate. I don't really understand these words. I haven't run the world's manual, so I'm not going to do with that. I'm going to leave it with that. Two more things in this. The first is just to tell you that they come here and tell you that you want like a nation state or whatever, right? Uday's POI is very important. Nation states have generally been extremely fucked up, brutal dictatorships that actually cause wars and go forward and kill millions of people. We are probably very happy if you don't have a nation state. I also go forward and tell you why. As really opposed to, and the counterfactual here is literally something like the EU which is actually able to go forward and take care of a huge group of people because you're literally not going to lose all these kind of support systems that you're talking about, something like the UN, that's what we support on our side of the house, not like a complete anarchy like OG, like CEO is trying to suggest, but like never really proves, right? But the second thing is like probably this is better for rich people to support and like more investment and stuff to flow into in the very first place, which is a mechanism for why nation states like happen in the first place, because probably if you have a more international world, you probably have more trade, you probably have more international confidence, you probably have more businesses and stuff that you can set up everywhere, Probably more internationalism means better trade, more rich people like probably buy into that as a concept more. But then also they like to try to focus on post-colonial states. I'm gonna go forward and tell you why post-colonial states is something that falls on our side. The first thing is just to say that if you're internationalist, you're much less likely to have colonialism as a whole because you're probably likely to see everyone as an equal. You're probably not likely to exclude anyone in the very first place. So the very basis of post-colonial states probably doesn't exist on their side of the house. But the second thing is just to say that you probably also have this belief that everyone is equal, even as the group that is fighting back against the colonizer, which means you have more ability to go forward and advocate for yourself because you have that intrinsic belief and you have greater international support when you go forward and say, ah, all of us are equal. There is literally no difference that exist at all points of time. But third, you also have access to more resources to fight back against colonization because you have more international support because of the same understanding that globalization um, and international understanding or whatever is to happen. But the third thing, all those like, extraneous benefits that they tried to give, like say things like, oh, capitalism existed, laws existed, democracy existed, all of this absolutely gets better on our side of the house and we actually flip all of their claims because when you have a more international understanding of what, like say, it should be done for capitalism without excluding literally anyone, without excluding, say, poor people in Africa because they're not part of your national identity, because they're excluding Muslims from India because they're not part of your national identity and only a Hindu can be uh, uh, an Indian. At that point of time, you have better forms of capitalism, you have better forms of healthcare, you have better forms of democracy. That's where you actually fulfill all of what uh, closing government is trying to say. Before I move on to OG, I'll give you a chance to like, ask. Nate? Oh, yeah. Right. The forms of nationalism will be symmetric, i.e. racism will be a large scale in this internationalism that would be manifest by the US. This one 
and political benefits, and two, proves our claim to racism is not something that's natural within the conveyance of everything. Yeah, I'm actually going to come to that, and I think that's right there, so all good. Uh, I think OG has like four major claims. The first is that all the alternatives are bad, and that's wonderfully taken over by extension and probably nobody else, because we are the only team that actually tells you that an alternative really exists, and it's not whatever OG says, and it's probably really poor. Right. The second thing they give you is that you probably feel really good right. about yourself, right? And I think this is where the racism ideas also come in from. I think the problem with this is largely just to say that when you have a more international approach and you start thinking that's an Indian, I come to Australia, and I'm not really thinking that Australians are different people, they're not an out group that I'm not a national that I'm part of, that we are all humans, that we are all international people, we are all international cosmopolitans, at that point of time, Australians are also an in group that I will feel much happier about together. This makes it so that you actually feel all kinds of happiness and better on our side of the house and not of OG, which means they flip that better like for happiness metric. But the third thing they try to push is that it's better for most vulnerable people, right? I think this is where racism comes in. I think the first thing is just to say that nation states are notoriously bad for, like, say, pushing people out and causing things like the caste system or whatever. Like, India right now, BJP, is literally trying to push Muslims out because they want to create this Hindu state identity for India at all points of time. That does not exist in the international sphere because you don't really need an outgroup in an international sphere at all points of time. That's why racism does not exist because racism comes from an idea that there is an outgroup that you need to manipulate. You don't necessarily need that on our side of the house, which is why racism goes out. Even in the best case, even if, like, say, it is a exclusive to like say uh, uh, like nationalism at least we don't have that on our side of the house we get a benefit over them but then just to next to say that internationally it's probably better because like generally a lot of like racist narratives and stuff are created because of nationalist incentives to create the outgroup in the very first place that is to say you really don't have an incentive to say some people are worse than you or worse than you if unless you mean to authorize them and at a point of time where you have no incentive to authorize them you probably don't have to do that kind of stuff this leads to greater legitimacy for a lot of different indigenous groups as well like Say, like say tribes within India or indigenous groups within Australia who have forever been pushed away because nationalism means that this land is something that the white person wants and not anyone else. But that's no longer land that the white person has to get to de-pledge to myself, everyone else. Everyone is equal. That's why we take over OG. That's why we take over OG. That's why we take over OG. Believe in a world that we are all equal. Extremely proud of course.